are you guys ready to worship? I want to invite you all to stand to your feet. Let's put our hands together.
And we thank you for today. We thank you that you're in every circumstance that we're walking through right now, Lord. We love you. The reign of darkness now has ended in the kingdom of light, in the kingdom of light. Forever under your dominion, you're the king of my life, you're the king of my life. Let's sing this. Yes, you reign above it all, you reign above it all. And over the universe and over every heart, there is no higher name. Jesus, you reign above it all. And on the cross, the work is finished. God, you poured out your life. Jesus, you reign 
above it all Let all of heaven and the earth erupt in song You sing hallelujah to the everlasting one There is no higher name It's Jesus you reign above it all our hands in the room just embrace the king of kings he's so worthy of our best worship not just any worship but our best worship amen can we lift our voice and sing this out a thousand generations falling down in worship to sing the song song of ages to the Lamb. So your name is the highest, your name is the greatest, your name stands above them all. All thrones and dominions, all powers and positions, your name stands above them all and the angels cry all creation cries sing. you are lifted been forgiven say. if you've been forgiven and if you've been redeemed sing the song forever to come on walk in your freedom and if you walk in freedom and if you bear his name sing the song forever to the lamb can we sing that out loud come on say sing the song
sing this up. Let all the other nights fade away. Can you sing that out? Let all the other nights fade away. Until there's only you. Let all the other nights fade away. So Jesus, take your place. Jesus, take your place. Sing it together, sing. things that get in the way of Jesus, the one and only sing. Let all the other names fade away until there's only you. Let all the other names fade away. Jesus, take Jesus, take your place. Jesus, take your place. Jesus, take your place. sing today. So hear your people sing. Jesus, allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you because where two or three are gathered in his name, his presence is in the midst. And I don't want anybody to miss what the Lord has to say to them in this moment. I don't want this to be a distraction. I don't want that to be a distraction. I don't want your life, what you have going on to be a distraction. Let's close our eyes and press into this moment and allow God to speak to us. Tell him what he is to you. Verbally, tell him what he is to you. 
Is he the King of Kings? Is he the Lord of Lords? Is he a healer to you? Is he a restorer to you? Thank him for what he's done. We're going to take a moment just to sing the chorus again. Let's sing it with a little bit of conviction today. Can we lift our hands and just make this one big choir? Do the best we can to make it as loud as possible to sing to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords to give him our best worship. Is that why we're here today, family? Am I in the right room? So just lift your hands, lift your voice, and sing it out. And the angels cry. You sing. I can't hear you, family. I can't hear you. Sing. Say, hear your peace. Jesus is our message, and we believe that we can share the message of Jesus, not just with our words, but with our actions. I, I can't tell you how excited it is for us to be able to bless people. For the last 26 years, we have been sharing the tangible love of Jesus with people in our community through a powerful event called Toys for Joy. And this year, each of our six campuses is participating in Toys for Joy in unique ways. From hosting community dinners to toy distributions, our goal is to provide joy to children and families in a season where it can sometimes run dry. And we need your help. We need businesses to help sponsor. We need people to purchase toys in our digital toy store. And we need people just like you to join the team and serve. To learn more about Toys for Joy and to get involved, visit sdrock.com slash toys. Hey, what's up, family? Happy Sunday. Happy Sunday. How's everybody doing today? Good. Can everybody stand up? We want to welcome all our campuses all around San Diego and in Hawaii and everybody watching online. God bless y'all, let's give them a big hand out there. God bless y'all. <laughs> happy Thanksgiving, Merry Christmas, Happy Kwanzaa, whatever you guys are doing, happy everything. Uh, welcome to the Rock Church. How many of y'all are visitors from out of town? Anybody raise your hand? God bless y'all, God bless y'all. Let's give them a big hand out there, God bless you. Uh, in a minute, I'm going to pray, and then we're going to take our offering that we haven't taken, and we're going to do it at all the campuses together. This is our second Heart for the House and final Heart for the House offering. We took it last week, and then we'll get into the message. We have a, a good uh, uh, message for you. How many of y'all uh, like coming to church and being challenged? Amen. Okay. How many of y'all just want to come to church just to come to church so you check the box? Don't raise your hand. Did you? <laughs> I don't care. I just come in and just, I ain't got nothing to do. I hope I can find a girlfriend. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> True story. Years ago, before I started to rock, and I was at, a, at another church, uh, Horizon, where I was youth pastor, and I was doing the Wednesday night service, and I said, hey, turn around and say hi to somebody. And this guy turned around and said, hey, my name is Dan. And the girl said, my name is Ann. And they've been married for like 35 years. Amen. <laughs> How many of y'all want that anointing today? How many of y'all want that anointing today? Okay, okay. All right, let's go. Let's do it. Let's do it. I, I, I like matchmaking. Let's do it. Lord, thank you so much for today. I pray you're blessed uh, today. I pray there's a, a supernatural divine connection. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, here's the deal. Here's the deal. Ladies, if you meet a guy, don't put it on me if it don't work out. 
is on you. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to turn around and ask somebody who you don't know, doesn't have to be a, you know, just a person. Look them in the eye. When they tell you their name, I want you to use their name in a sentence, and I want you to say, do you know, Jimmy, God loves you. Okay? Go ahead and do that. Okay. Did anybody get called Jimmy and you weren't, your name is Jimmy? <laughs> Some people are really literal, right? They, they, they're rule followers. How many of y'all are rule followers? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Hi, Jimmy. Uh, <laughs> her name was Jane. Okay. Um, get out your uh, envelope. If you got an envelope, if you didn't get an envelope and a pledge card, please raise your hand. Now, ushers will bring and usherettes will bring this to you. Last week, we finished our series, Heart for the House. And we had an offering, our goal was $6 million. I want to show you where we're at right now. We're at $2 million. Can you put the house up there? There we go. Can we, can we put that house up there? Here we go. Here we go. Okay. So we are, we are a little ways to go. We will get what we get, and we will do with what we do with what we get. Amen? Amen. So if you could take this card out. Uh, the three initiatives were to know God, which is under know God. We want to help people un, uh, be evangelized and, and receive Christ as their Savior. We're going to do a training to equip all of you to share your, your family and friends to Christ. I am most excited about that, anything in my life right now, uh, other than stuff in my family. But as far as church goes, I cannot wait to do that. Kingdom expansion, we're going to have a... a, a, a Days away, hopefully, from signing a contract for a new campus in Chula Vista. I know they're screaming right now down there. Come on now, come on now. Environmental refresh, world missions is all in the no God grown community. Next gen, we have a lot of great things for next, next gen online outreach, discipleship pathway, and make a difference. Um, toys for Joy, which is our big ticket item that we still have a lot of toys and we need money to buy a lot of toys. Uh, we have about six. 6,000 toys to purchase, so if you want to give towards that, this would be a great time. So just pull out your um, envelope, and I'm going to read something to you. Because whenever you give, you always want to be given, giving with the right heart. And if you're a guest, be our guest today, you don't feel any pressure from us to, to uh, collect anything from you, if God so puts it on your heart. But I want to read something from First Chronicles where King David was going to build a temple. He wanted to build a temple, and God told him, no, you can't do it. Your son's going to do it. You've been a man of war. He's been a man of love, so I want, you, I want a man of peace. Uh, I want you to fund it. And so he said, okay. So he gathered the resources to build the temple. What we are doing, anytime you give, you are giving to build the kingdom of God to build a church, to build and, and to fund the vision to reach people for Christ. As I told you last week, we are here to reach people for Christ. If you know Christ, how can we invest in you spiritually and then how can you go out and invest in someone who doesn't know Christ? Can I get amen? amen. Just to be clear, okay, this, this is not like, you know, entertainment tonight. We come here, I, I just want to get mine. We're here to get ours and then go out and share the gospel. And so David was going to build the temple of God to invest in the kingdom and provide a place for people to enter into the presence of God. And I want to read something to you. And there are four words I want you to key on. Um, one is uh, affection. Say affection. He had an affection for, the, for, for God's house. That when you come to church, it's not, yeah, I just go there. No, I love it. I love it. That there's an affection for not only this building and the rock as a 501c3, you know, nonprofit organization, but I love the family of God. I love what it gives me. I love what it allows me to give. Um, uh, and so he, David had an affection, an emotional a, a attachment to the house of God. He and his leaders gave willingly. Everyone say willingly. They gave with a loyal heart. Say a loyal heart. And then they rejoice. They rejoice. Willingly, they had an affection. They gave it a loyal heart, and they rejoiced. Let me read this to you. It says, 1 Chronicles 29.1. Furthermore, King David said to all the assembly, My son Solomon, whom God alone has chosen, is young and inexperienced. And the work is great, because the temple is not for man, but for the Lord God. What we do is not for each other, it's for God. Now for the house of my God, I have prepared, this is David talking, with all my might, gold for things to be made of gold, silver for things of silver, bronze for things of bronze, 
iron for things of iron, wood for things of wood, onyx stones, stones to be set, glistening stones of various colors, all kinds of precious stones and marble slabs in abundance. This is what he has collected. Moreover, because I've set my affection on the house of God, his, his whole affection was not on his bank account, even though he was very wealthy, it was really, how can I help God? I have given to the house of my God over and above all that I prepared for the holy house. My own special treasure of gold and silver, 3,000 talents of gold, the gold of Ophir, 7,000 talents of refined silver to overlay the walls of the house Houses, the gold for things of gold, the silver for things of silver, and all kinds of work to be done by the hands of craftsmen. Who then, he's talking to his leaders, is willing to consecrate himself this day to the Lord. Then the leaders of the father's houses, leaders of the tribes of Israel, the captains of thousands and of hundreds, with officers over the king's worth, offered, work offered willingly. Everyone say willingly. They gave for the work of the house of God 5,000 talents, 10,000 talents of gold, 10,000 talents of silver, 18,000 talents of bronze, 100,000 talents of iron. And whoever had precious stones gave them to the treasury of the house of the Lord into the hands of Jehiel the, the Gershonite. Then the people rejoiced. Everyone say rejoiced. For they had offered willingly. Say willingly. Because they had a loyal heart. Say loyal heart. Then they offered willingly. Say willingly. To the Lord and King David rejoiced greatly. Lord, we just thank you for what's getting ready to happen. We praise you in advance for what you're going to do, not only through the offering in ministry, but in the hearts of the people who give. We pray that you would move on people's hearts, whether they're giving $5 or $500,000, that you would move in their heart and they would hear clearly from you. And that you have blessed them. You have given all of us the ability to create wealth. You have given us the ability to build the kingdom. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you could pull out this white envelope. Everyone wave it in the air. Let me see that you got this white envelope. Very good. And it will be on the screen. And I'm going to give you a few minutes. On that white envelope, you can make your pledge. Give your donation. We're going to have the buckets pass here in a minute. You can make a one-time gift, top left recurring gift, fill in your credit card information if that's what you want to do, your personal information, and in about two minutes we will collect that. Check one, two, ready to go? Y'all ready? Say amen. amen. Let me pray one more time. You can't pray enough. Amen. Lord, bless our service. Amen. There we go. There we go. I, <laughs> you like that prayer. God's like, you don't need to talk. I already know what you're going to say. <laughs> you do. Um, I, matter of fact, I was um, uh, with my grandson the other day, and I was uh, trying to figure out an easy way to teach him to pray. Three words, and I'll, I'll test this out on you. Thank you, sorry, please. Everyone say thank you. Thank you. Say sorry, sorry. please. Please. Imagine praying like this. Dear God, thank you for blah, 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 blah. Sorry for blah, 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 blah. Please bless blah, 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 blah. So, Lord, we say thank you. Say thank you. Sorry for our sin. Please bless us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. Very good. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Give that brother a big hand. Give that brother a big hand. I love speaking of music. This is like, <laughs> um, if you have a Bible, turn to Joshua chapter 5. How many of you, by a show of hands, or you could say amen, have people in your family, your friends that are, have different political views than you? Can I get amen? Okay. And how many have hard times having those conversations or you avoid, avoid them all together? It, it could be about politics. It could be about racism. It could be about social issues. It's like, Hey, amen. So uh, five years ago, I can't believe it's been that long, so I wrote a book called The Third Option. And one of the key passages was what I'm going to read to you today. Because my heart, my heart is to unite people to God, unite people to each other, and unite people to their purpose. That's my heart. Unite people to God, unite people to each other, and unite people to their purpose. No God-grown community make a difference. That is my, my passion of my life. And it breaks my heart to see people disuni dis disunity between them and God, with each other, and with why they were created. And so I want to read something to you because God gives us a very interesting 
uh, uh, insight in this passage about how we need to deal with these difficult conversations, especially now, it just gets more and more divided. Look what it says. Joshua is leading the Israelites into the promised land. Joshua is God's man leading God's people into God's land. Joshua is God's man leading God's people into God's land. And he is going to be confronted by God. And he is going to ask God, are you on our side or our enemy side? Now, it's very important for you to understand because we live in this us first them culture where if you don't agree with me, you're my enemy. And in this passage, God is going to address that very question. If you're not on my side, you must be my enemy. And so Joshua is going to say to God, remember, Joshua is God's man leading God's people into God's land. And he's going to be confronted by God. He's going to say to God, are you on our side or our enemy side? And God is going to give him a very interesting answer. And this answer is going to be the foundation of a conversation I'm going to have here in a minute with with our guest today about how we engage in these conversations in a way that honors God, not ourself. Can I get amen? Look what it says. It says, verse 13, it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, a man stood opposite him with a sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua said to him, are you for us or our adversary? It is implied that if you're not on my side, you're my enemy. What you hear in the media is that if you don't believe what I believe, you must be my enemy. That is a mindly, worldly mindset. That's not a biblical mindset. I'm going to say it two more times. That's not a biblical mindset. That's not a biblical mindset. If you don't agree with me, that doesn't make you my enemy. My wife is sitting here. I, we don't agree on everything. And we have disagreements every day about something. And it's not the end of the world. We're just people. We, you see things, we see things differently. She's not wrong. I'm not wrong. We, we just, well, sometimes I am wrong. <laughs> but just because someone doesn't agree with you doesn't make them wrong. And so we have to understand who we are as Christians, okay? And then, so he says to God, are you on, for us or our enemies? Now you would think Joshua's God's man, God's people, God's land. You would think God would say, of course I'm for you. You're my people. <laughs> Look what he says. He said no. Everyone say no. no. As commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. Joshua fell on his face and worship and said, what does my Lord say to his servant? And the commander of the Lord said to Joshua, take your sandal off your feet for where you stand in holy ground. Watch this. He said, Joshua, when you were in my presence and because you are my guy, you do not belong to this land. You are not a citizen of this earth. You are ambassador of heaven. So I want you to always act like an ambassador of heaven. In a minute, we're going to have, I'm going to bring up a guest. We're going to talk about having political conversations. And conversations with people who have different views than you. And what we always have to remember as an ambassador of Christ, as an ambassador of heaven, wherever you are, you must represent Christ, not your political party, not your social justice position, not your friend's position, but you must represent Christ. It doesn't mean you don't have an opinion. But whatever your opinion is, how you express that must represent and honor God first. Can I get amen? This is very, very important. So what I want to bring up, a good friend of mine, she's on our board. She's a good friend. She actually helped me write the third option. We'll get to that in a minute. Uh, She used to be a White House staffer. She ran for Congress. She's a political commentator. So I want you all all to get to your feet and stand and give a warm welcome to Denise Gitchum. Come on, Denise. Hello, hello, hello. Hello, hello. And let, let me show you a book. Let me show you a book so you may be seated. <laughs> she wrote this book called Politics for People Who Hate Politics. How many of y'all hate politics? <laughs> How many of y'all hate politics? <laughs> yeah. and, and by the way, uh, you know, I, I was reading something the other day that people, most people, I think it did say most people, mm-hmm. just are fed up with politics. They're fed up with the garbage. They're fed up with the hypocrisy. Can I get amen? <laughs> okay. However, can you explain that we're all in politics right now? (laughs) Yeah, I mean, well, first of all, I share your pain. Um, I've been in politics my whole life, but there are moments more than I care to admit that I actually hate politics too. But the reality is you may not like politics, but politics is coming for you. Because we live in America, we are all part of shaping our democracy. And so whether you engage or choose not to, you're making a political statement. So uh, I, with that, let's jump in we'll because jump in. there's so many reasons to engage, especially as believers. First, give, give personal background, yeah. the involvement with the church, yes. et cetera. Well, first of all, I feel like I'm, this, is, this is my true family right here in every campus. 
I feel I identify as a San Diegan. I lived here for 10 years. Um, all the people that are closest to me, including you, Pastor Miles, people who've shaped my, the way that I think about God and life, everyone, everything starts. This is ground zero for me. So thank you for being my family. Thank you for letting me serve on the board of The Rock. It's an honor and privilege to just love you all and serve. This is super fun for me Good. to be here. Um, but before I came to San Diego, I was in Washington, D.C. for 10 years um, in a pit of vipers. It was very divisive in Washington, D.C. And I served President George W. Bush for a couple years in the White House through 9-11. I was very young when that happened, just to be clear. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then I got to work in the Senate on some confirmations for a couple of Supreme Court justices. I went to law school there at Georgetown. I, I worked as a lawyer very briefly. I didn't like it as much as I liked politics. And so I got out and then I came back home to California and I ran for Congress here in 2016. So I've definitely been on sort of all sides of political campaigning, including being a candidate. And there's nothing, you understand this as a pastor, there is nothing like having your faith tested, like being on a stage and having to be nice to people who hate you. Like literally, there's nothing like, you say all these great things when you talk about, theoretically, we should all be like this. But then you're on a stage and people are throwing verbal assaults at you. Sometimes they throw actual things at you. And the people that you think you can trust the most ending up being the people who shank you from the side. And then, and then all of a sudden, all these things, these principles that you're saying, oh, I learned this in church. God taught me. He loves me. I feel love for you. All of a sudden, you have to act like it. And that's like a completely different story. And that's really when I started to think about the principles and what do I really believe mm -hmm, in. Mm -hmm. Can I act out on those principles when my enemies are actually, you know, my brothers and sisters in Christ because they disagree with me on this issue? I feel like I had to mature very quickly. Mm -hmm. And let me tell you, I failed more often than not. This book is not about me preaching to you. This is a book about me preaching to me. Like, I struggle to live out these principles every single day. And apart from the power of God and the Holy Spirit in my life, I would fail every single time. And give you context, when I was writing the third option in 2017, 18, and for all you don't know, it was about racial reconciliation. And I would sit over there every Sunday for over a year while I was writing a book. And the devil was saying in my head, that book's going to divide your church. Because you have people who believe this on one side, people who believe this on the other side. You know, racism is a very divisive topic. And people are dug in in their position. But I said, no, God, we're going to thread this needle. We're going to, we're going to thread this needle. We got we to gotta say something to bring people together. And I, and I had two uh, writers. I'm not a writer. I'm, I'm not a writer, writer. I'm an author, but I'm not that good a writer. Yeah, yeah. You're good. And I had these two writers, and they were jacking it up, and, and it was not coming. And I said, Denise, I'm just not feeling good about this. And I brought it to her, and she said, this is not you. So we ended up writing a book like in three months. It was due the day before I gave it to her. It was crazy. But what, the, the reason it was so important is because all of us in here have opinions about something. And a lot of times our opinions and how we express them are not biblical, and especially how we express them. But we have to learn how to engage people lovingly instead of just saying, I went to church, I have a troop, I'm still going to hold my position and hold the way I express it. But it's how we express it is so critical. It's so it's, critical. Amen, amen. And actually, when we wrote that, when we were going through the process of helping Pastor Miles express God's heart in, on that issue, um, I told him, I, I have the email still, Pastor Miles. I said, we should really do a third option for politics. And you were like, thanks, but no. <laughs> and I was like, fine, if you won't do it, I will. And so very, like a lot of the principles in here are going to sound very familiar to our family. But believe it or not, not everyone's blessed to have a pastor like Pastor Miles, who's actually able to foster a community in an environment where when I look into this this church and into all of your faces, we're all so different. We represent the beauty and the diversity and the glory of God. And it's in that diversity when we, we decide to unify because of it and in spite of it because our unity, what we unify around is so much greater than what we look like or where we come from. That's the true strength of the church. So you're so blessed, we're so blessed to have Pastor Miles because he is the one that sets the tone and you being ground zero for all of these principles in this book and in his book are gonna be able to change our community here first and you're gonna be an example for the rest of the world. So talk about John, John 17, unity. Yeah. Unity, yeah, unity book ends your book. You're supposed to put up the scripture because I'm not a pastor and I can't remember scripture like that. <laughs> 
But I'll you read, guys, yeah. thank, you, thank you. I'll Save me. You. I need a lifeline. It says, I do not, I do not, this is Jesus talking. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. Then in verse 21. 21, yeah. That they may be one. Everyone say one. As you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. Right. So what is he saying in that scripture? So the, first of all, there's 179 passages in the Bible that talk about the importance of unity to God. Can you believe that? 179, that blew my mind. I got that from somebody else. I think I got it from Francis Chan in his book, Until Unity. But you know, we talk about all the things we wanna do for God. There are so many easy things that we can do for God. We can be sacrificial, we can you know, obey, we can all this. All of those are important, but we need to also have the character, character and heart of God. So when we stand for things that we believe, we have to make sure that A, we're standing on truth, which is rooted in God's principles, not in partisan agendas. And second, we have to show up in the character that God wants us to show up in. And I would argue that people are going to watch as Christians, as people who stand and say, I am a child of God. They're judging you automatically based on, they're judging God based on you. That's why it's so important to be a witness. And so when we inside the body of Christ, decide that partisan talking points and agendas are gonna get in the middle of our unity and divide us, we're feeding right into the scheme of Satan. Satan comes to steal, kill, and destroy, and there's nothing he likes to do more than get in between you and I when we disagree and say, you're done. We lose all of our power, all of our authority, and we lose our witness when we allow division to come between us. Talk about how we need to engage in politics, and, and not only politics, but tough discussions. Yeah. Talk about engagement. Yeah, we don't really shy away from tough issues, do we? <laughs> Racism, no big deal. And, you know, let, politics, and, religion. And, and let me say, some, this is my experience, and none, as she said, we're not perfect. I've said so many things I shouldn't have said over the years and will continue. So uh, this is a lot of times what people are saying from the pulpit is stuff they've learned from mistakes they've made. However, um, a lot of times we want to take the safe road. We want to say, I have my truth. I'm not going to step out in, hot, in deep water. I'm not going to get involved in tough conversations. I just want to play it safe. And God, if Jesus did that, he wouldn't have died on the cross. Mm -hmm. And so there are going to be times in your, com in your life, in relationships you have, where you need to step out and say, Lord, I'm going to engage in this and learn from it. So talk about that. Yeah, well... There are many times that we are indeed tempted to step back, and I feel like it's such a lost opportunity. Obviously, you have to use discernment when you do decide to step in, but when we ask the Lord to help us engage in a manner worthy of Christ, he empowers us. You know, we have the Holy Spirit. We have an advantage in the, over the world. We have the Holy Spirit living inside of us, so we can say, Lord, I can't love this person, but you can help me love this person. Will you help me to love this person? Will you give me the words to say, Lord? Will you help me to thread that needle? And I think what you said about standing up and really engaging is so important. Can any of you, any of you, I can answer, I know the answer. I'm just, you know, stick with me on this. Can anyone really feel like they love somebody or are loved by somebody that they disagree with if they can't speak their truth? You know, this is the difference between this culture of tolerance what is tolerance? Like, ask, ask Debbie. Debbie, do you think that if, if Pastor Miles tolerates you, that's the same thing as loving you? And can you feel a difference? She's talking to my wife. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, ask my anyone wife, next Debbie, to you that you love. <laughs> There's a huge difference between tolerating someone, just saying, oh, fine, I'll put up with you, or maybe I'll just leave. And actually, love is sacrificial. I mean, if you've been to a wedding, you know 1 Corinthians 13 inside out and backwards, whether you read the Bible or not. And you know what love is. Love is patient, love is kind, and all the other things that God says. And so when we engage, it's so important that not only that we engage fully as who we are in the truth that God has given us to speak, but that we do so with love. Now, this is one issue that I said, Pastor Miles, don't let me forget to speak about it. And I'm glad I remembered so he doesn't have to remind me. But um, so often what I hear from Christians in politics, and it, it just breaks me every time I hear it, it's such a lie, is that when we speak the truth, that is love. How many times have you guys thought that? Well, what's the most loving thing to speak truth? Okay, that's partially true. Satan loves to come in and give partial truth as the whole truth, but that's only part of it. There's no such thing as truth apart from love. That part, that's right. 
but you can say a lot of things very unlovingly. And if God, if God is with you, he can give you the power to say things, the harder the truth, the more lovingly you have to say it. So often we just write it off and say, it's the truth and therefore it's loving, deal with it, suck it up. But love, people know when they're loved, just like people know when they're barely being tolerated. God is very clear that love feels loving. You may not like it, but when you show up in love and respect and you show up with honorable assumptions about people and you say, I see that God loves you. You're as valuable to me as you are to God because of who you are, not because of what you believe in. It changes the whole dynamic of how we speak the truth in love. So you need both in equal parts. Let me give an example. So let's say your wife is late. That never happens, right, Debbie? This is not my, this is not my, this is not my reality. My wife's never late. Uh, Maybe change the example then. <laughs> <laughs> um, you could say to someone they're late in a way that condemns them for being late, or you could say something, say it in a way that's encouraging. My wife will say it to me in a very sweet way and remind me and I'm get convicted, or it, it could be said in a very condemning way. I think what, what, the point of what she's saying is that we have to think about how do we say our truth and how do we walk confidently in the truth that we have and free, and free to say that truth, but as long as we have love, we can have that freedom. But if we walk around thinking I'm gonna bop someone on the head with it, then we, we walk around with a little tension that I'm gonna co have a confrontation. Imagine if you can learn to say your truth all the time in a way where people can receive it. They don't have to agree with it. And by the way, receiving something is not necessarily agreeing with somebody. Because we have to talk, we have to, you talked about agreeing with your enemies. Yeah. Because it's, it's one thing to confront your enemy. It's another thing to be in agreement with your enemy that we're going to disagree but still be friends. Right. My best friend back home, we have disagreements all the time, but he is like my brother and we are going to be friends till we, till, till we go into the grave. But we disagree and we are, are agreeable about that. Talk about being in agreement with your enemies because that's another issue that if we can get past that, we can yes. really be a bright light in the community. Well, I mean, all of you know you and I can speak until we're blue in the face trying to convince you that you're wrong and I'm right, and it's never gonna work. It doesn't matter like how convincing or how clever your words are, your arguments. That's not your job. That's the Holy Spirit's job is to convict and change hearts. I think when we take the responsibility of feeling like we have to win this argument, and listen, I'm a lawyer, I like to win. I like to argue, I like to win. It is so hard, that's why I read this book, to remind myself, what do I need to do again, Denise? Um, you know, when we agree to disagree, and we do so lovingly, we can say, you know what? God has given, it's honoring that person's story and how they got to the truth that God has given them to share. It doesn't change the truth. It's another perspective on his truth if we're clinging to kingdom principles over partisan politics. So as long as we can agree and say, hey, you know, I honor where you are. I see your point. I still think this policy is better for more people. This policy is going to help more people flourish. But I recognize why. And that requires what? Humility. I think one thing that we all have to start off is, I don't know about y'all, but the closer I get to God, the more I feel like, man, I'm really screwing up. You know, like, I, I'm not one of those people who feels like, wow, I've really, I've really nailed this Christian thing. You know, the closer I get to God, the darker I see the parts of my heart, and I think, Lord, thank God for your grace. I need so much more of it all the time. I think that happens whenever we're genuinely curious. We realize, think about when you travel. You go in a new culture, you're like, I have no idea what's going on here. I didn't even know people thought like this. The more you see, the more, the more knowledge you have, the less clear that you are that you have 100% lock on the truth. And I think that's just so important to engage in humility. And most, I think, if you establish from the outset of a conversation where you know you're gonna disagree with somebody, you establish the outset what your intentions are for this conversation. Are you going in to go for the kill? That's generally where I am. I'm like, I'm gonna knock you down and I'm gonna make you bleed. Right, that's just my nature, that's my human nature. But God has changed the way that I engage because he's helped me to see that the same person, same Denise that travels across the world to be a missionary for Jesus and tell people how much God loves you is the same Denise that needs to show up in that conversation with a friend that she disagrees with. 
it's no sense flying halfway across the country, raising a bunch of support to tell people God loves them if you're going to be a jerk to them. So we're going to land this plane with this question um, because I think it's very important for us to, to put this in a bigger context. Every time you have a conversation with somebody about anything, and especially people who don't agree with you or you don't agree with, which, by the way, as Christians, I would challenge all of you to um, ask the Holy Spirit to guide you into those conversations so you can be in it and shine your light and not have to win an argument. You're not there to win an argument. You're there to win a relationship. But I want you to think about this, that whenever you're in a discussion with someone who doesn't agree with you, the enemy is not that person. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. Amen. We wrestle against principalities and powers and the rules of darkness of this age. It is the devil. Can I get amen? Amen. And how can you as a, as a believer be a better believer who engages in those conversations from a spiritual perspective? And so I want you to address that last question and then I'm, then I'm going to close it out here for a minute. Yeah. I mean, when, when you ask the Lord to prepare your heart to engage with someone that you know you're gonna disagree with. And you ask him to help you see them as he sees them. It changes the way that you engage in that conversation from the start. We are all, first and foremost, our identity is in Christ. If, if it's in anything else, if it's in an elephant, a donkey, blue, red, purple, whatever party you ascribe to, you've already, you're already on the, starting on the wrong foot. So when we look at each other, when we identify as Christians first and foremost, and we can look for that in the person we're talking to, we become ambassadors of heaven. We actually, everywhere we step, we're bringing kingdom with us. We can transform an atmosphere in a room. It doesn't matter what's happening. We are actually thermostats, not thermometers. I learned that in youth group when I was growing up, right? We're not here to reflect politics as usual. We're actually here to change the conversation, to change and bring solutions to our country that help God's people flourish. And so just having those intentions, having the right mindset about what our true identity is in Christ, and then recognizing that in others is literally gonna change everything about how we do politics. And actually, it's gonna save our nation because I don't know if you all are aware, but our greatest threat is not China. It's not the war in the Middle East. Those are things that we see on TV that scare us and that are, you know, they're just horrible and heartbreaking. But our greatest enemy is what Satan sees in our heart, which is hatred for one another. So we can turn that around and we can win this war and we can change this country that we are so blessed to live in and be a part of. We can save that for every generation to come and our generation if we show up this way. In our last presidential election, right when it started, I, I started <laughs> preached a sermon called Red or Blue, What Would Jesus Do? <laughs> so good. <laughs> you know, let's, let's, let's just poet. jump in and just <laughs> jump in it. And, um, uh, they, uh, and now you're probably wondering, well, what was the answer? Uh, and I started with saying, Is Jesus, was Jesus political? 100%. He was a king. He had his own government. He didn't want either one of those Red or Blue. He is the king. There's no voting him in. And when he was on earth, they challenged him, should you, render, should you give to Caesar? Do you pay taxes? And he said, give me a coin. And, he, and one side, it said, this is Caesar's. He says, well, he said, render to Caesar what is Caesar's and render to God what is God's. He says, give Caesar his tax. Vote for who you're going to vote for. Neither the Republicans or the Democrats are going to save the world. They're not. It's going to be God. Amen. And so first you have to understand that and be committed to that. Now, whatever side you're on the aisle, be on that side, but just make sure you are more Christian than your political view. But, but here's the thing. If you, here's what God says. God says, Jesus said in Matthew 20, 21, 22, render to Caesar what's Caesar's, render to God what's God's. 21, 22, 21, 22, 21. Render to Caesar what's Caesar's, render to God what's God's. Vote who you're going to vote for, but give them your vote, but don't give them your heart. Give God your heart. Amen. And so we have to start with that, that our heart is with God in every situation we're in, whether it's politically correct, whether we're going to offend our family or not, I am not going to offend God. I'm going to honor God in now what I say, but how I say it. Because how I say it can invalidate what I say. And so in a minute, I'm going to give some of y'all an opportunity 
I'm going to give all y'all opportunity, but some of y'all are going to take it because you're already saved, to give your heart to God. We don't want you to give your heart to an organization. We want you to give your heart to God. And when God has your heart, he's the one that's going to change your, your life, your views, your attitude, how you engage in people. I, and this is just a pet peeve for me, I love engaging people who I know have issue with me. How can I love them? Because it's going to be a test for me. It's going to be an opportunity for me to shine his light on them. But it has to start with me having his heart. And as we go into Christmas season, you're going to be around your family. Then we go into election. The, the world is divided over everything. That we have to step back and go, as, as the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, you're on holy ground. You're not on that nation's soil. You're not on that nation's soil. You're not in that political party. You belong to me. And so if you belong to me, here's how I want you to act. Here's how I want you to do this thing. It's going to be supernatural. You're going to be above all of it. You have to stay. And so not only are you going to live the truth, you're going to live, communicate it through a loving life. But it has to start with me having your heart. And you have to start with me, you acknowledging that the heart you have is not as good as the heart I want to give you. And so in a minute, I'm going to ask you to bow your heads in all the campuses and pray and give you opportunity to say, Lord, man, take my heart. I can't, I, this world is stressing me out. I need hope that I can't get from CNN or Fox or whatever. I can't, I, I, or, or ESPN or money. I need hope that comes from God. So I'm going to ask all of y'all to bow your heads and close your eyes and just listen to me carefully. But more importantly, listen to the Spirit of God, a small, still voice whispering in your heart. Lord, in 2023, you have chosen us to live in this world, in this time, during these difficult times, wars and the economy, politics, and just divisiveness at every level on every topic. And we seem to be caught up in it and confused about what to believe about each one of these issues. And we seem to be grabbing for the next concept, the next, next insight that may fly. But at the end of the day, we have to be committed and knowledgeable and clear about who we are in your eyes who you want us to be, how you want us to talk, how we're supposed to act. But it starts with a new heart. Where do murders and lies and fornication and adultery come from? They come from the heart. They don't come from politics. They come from the heart. The Bible says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, that every single one of us have a sinful heart. And the Bible says that while we were sinners, being influenced by our sinful heart. You demonstrated your love towards us by dying on the cross and rising from the dead to give us opportunity to have a new heart. If you would like to ask Christ to forgive you of your sin and to fill you with the Spirit of God and give you a new heart, take out your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh, a heart that is sensitive to the Word of God, to the heart of God, to the mind of God. I want you to pray this prayer with me in the privacy of your heart. It's a simple prayer of confession and acknowledgement that you need God in your life. Pray, dear God, I need a new heart. Please forgive me of my sin. I acknowledge that Jesus died and rose from the dead for me. Jesus, please forgive me. Fill me with the Spirit of God. I want to be born again. Just as Jesus said in John chapter 3 to Nicodemus. I want to be born again. Jesus, I repent and believe. I turn away from my old life. And I'm believing you to lead me into my future. Thank you, God. As our eyes are closed and our heads are bowed, if you prayed that prayer, in a minute I'm going to ask you to stand up. By standing, you are acknowledging that you 
are asking Jesus to be your Savior, you are acknowledging that you are asking God for a new heart. You are acknowledging that your old heart is not good enough. It is not good enough to be a good person because the standard for God is perfection. That's why he sent his perfect son to be a perfect sacrifice and perfect proof of life after death by rising from the dead. So if you prayed that prayer on the count of three, I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet and acknowledge your surrender to Jesus as your Savior. One, two, three. Stand to your feet if you prayed that prayer. God bless you. 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 Stay standing. Good. God bless you. God bless you. Come. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Before anybody moves, I'm going to ask all these people to come forward. Um, and after that, Denise will be out in the lobby to the left signing books. But all you people who are standing up, I'm going to ask you to come out of your seat. You can bring your loved, one, loved ones and come on down to the altar. Let's give them a big hand as they come on down. Come on, church. Amen. Come on, church. God bless you. God bless you. Just, just face me. That'd be good. How you doing, sir? God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you.